studies in the Gospel according to Mark have brought us at this point in the 15th chapter to what is undoubtedly both the heart and the climax of the story of the Gospel. And you may have noticed as we have come to this point in the Gospels that a very large percentage of the Gospel story, indeed in each of the Gospels, a large percentage of the Gospel story focuses attention on the passion of Jesus rather than on the three years of his ministry. And that is seen most notably perhaps here in Mark's Gospel where some 40% of the Gospel is taken up with the last seven days of the three years of Jesus' ministry. And indeed something like 15% of the Gospel is taken up with the last 24 hours of Jesus' life before he is crucified. So that the events to which we have now come in the story of the Gospel in terms of their amazing significance for us, far outweigh the number of days and the measurement of time involved in these different events. And in structuring the Gospels this way, there is no doubt whatsoever that, for example, Mark in his Gospel is reflecting the emphasis of the New Testament church. There is a very old tradition in the Christian church, as you may know, that in fact, in fact Mark's gospel was taken down largely from Simon Peter, whom Mark helped and served in the work of the gospel. And it is certainly in a striking way a reflection of the balance of Peter's ministry, where so much of the emphasis lies upon what Jesus did in the closing days and closing hours of his life. He did much to prepare himself for these days. And everything he did before these days has significance for our understanding of these days. But the gospel writers with one voice emphasize to us that when we come to the closing scenes of the gospel, we are at the very heart of the gospel message. And for that reason we need to pay special attention to what it is they have to say to us at this particular juncture. And you will notice how Mark, who gives a very abbreviated account of the incidents of that night when Jesus was denied and the following morning when he is eventually charged before Pontius Pilate. But the point at which his gospel has reached is, you will notice in chapter 14 verse 64, that the high priest has charged Jesus with blasphemy. And the whole of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, in verse 64, with one voice, condemn Jesus as worthy of death. But of course, in those days, the Jewish people were a servile people. They were subjugated to the great nation of Rome. And while it was possible for them to pass these sentences, it was not possible for them to execute such a sentence. The power of the sword had been taken from them. And Rome alone, the emperor and his representatives alone, held the power of life and death over a condemned criminal. And it is precisely for that reason that these religious authorities now hurriedly prepare to bring Jesus before the civil authorities, before the Roman government, in the person of its representative Pontius Pilate. And they do so, we are told, in chapter 15, verse 1, early in the morning. They meet together because there was a Jewish law to which they wanted to adhere that stated that a man could be found guilty on one day but he must have the sentence passed upon him the next day. And so they meet hurriedly in the morning, probably about three o'clock in the morning. And they reach their sentence, they reach their decision, as the New International Version puts it. 
and they bind Jesus and lead him away first thing in the morning to make sure that this matter is first thing on Pontius Pilate's agenda that they may have their sentence executed upon the Lord Jesus. Now it's interesting to note, although Mark doesn't explicitly say it, it's very obvious between the lines, that whereas before the Sanhedrin Jesus had been charged with blasphemy, before Pontius Pilate he is charged with the crime of treason. The crime of blasphemy would not have meant very much to Pontius Pilate. He despised the Jews and despised the Jewish religion and the Jewish leaders. But the crime of treason was a very different matter. And so they brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate and said, He claims that he is the king of the Jews. And of course the very mention of the word king brought alarm bells ringing in the mind of Pontius Pilate. After all, the only king that he was able to recognize was Caesar, his master. And his very job and life depended upon him maintaining the kingship of Caesar against all other claimants to be king, any part of the Roman Empire. So his ears are pricked up to listen and he asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? He no doubt asks him because he realizes instinctively from looking at Jesus, from seeing the kind of man Jesus is, as he begins to talk with Jesus, he immediately recognizes that this one is not at all like others who have claimed to be king. Not at all like others who have sought to overthrow the Roman government. Indeed at that very moment there was a man called Barabbas languishing in his jail. Who was accused of the very same crime of treason and was to be led out that very afternoon to be crucified with two others. And Pontius Pilate must have instinctively realized if he had an ounce of insight whatsoever that this man whom they said claimed to be king was entirely different from these others. And so he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, it is as you say. Other gospels tell us that Jesus began to unfold to Pontius Pilate precisely what he meant. In what sense he was a king, my kingdom, he said, is not of this world. In that sense it is no real threat to Caesar. Although, of course, ultimately it was to prove Caesar's greatest threat. And he began to explain to Pontius Pilate the meaning of his coming and the significance of his life. And so Pilate went back to the priests in verse 3. And the priests began to bring specific charges against Jesus. And so again Pilate went back to Jesus and asked him about these specific charges. And to these charges Jesus would say nothing, just as he had nothing to say to them when he was charged before the Sanhedrin in chapter 14. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was astounded. He was amazed. And then, of course, a situation arose that he thought was a godsend to him. He realized that to have this man executed was itself a criminal deed. But on the other hand, there were those outside gasping for his execution. What was he to do? And then suddenly some representatives of the people appeared. They were next on the agenda. They wanted to plead with him that he would do the customary thing at the Passover, that he would release one of the prisoners, a kind of Passover amnesty. Pilate breathed a sigh of relief and seized the opportunity and went out and took up the amnesty and offered them a prisoner. Will I release to you Jesus, your king, he said. And we know that stirred up by the high priests, the crowd began to shout, Crucify him and give us Barabbas. 
And so a situation that Pilate thought he had grasped turned into sand in his hands. But still troubled, we are told in verse 15, he wanted to pacify the crowd and so he released Barabbas. That was one thing. And then the next stage was to have Jesus flogged. And it is at that point John's gospel adds something to the story and tells us that after Jesus was flogged, he was dragged out, humiliated, broken. Men died from such floggings on occasion. And Pilate said, look at the man. Look at him. Will you not have pity on your king now? And they cried out all the more, crucify him, crucify him. According to John, Pilate went back into Jesus again and virtually pled with Jesus to provide some excuse by which he could release him and not crucify him. But all was in vain. And he went out one final time to appeal to the people. And they cried out to Pontius Pilate, If you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And he said, Shall I crucify your king? And they replied to his amazement and horror, We have no king but Caesar. And he knew there was nothing else he could do. And yet what I want you to see with me this morning in the midst of this dramatic story is this. That it is not at all either the crowd or the priests or Pontius Pilate who stand in the middle of the stage in the Passion narrative. And while it is certainly legitimate for us to think about them and their different reactions to Jesus, and we shall certainly do that in a moment, what Mark really wants us to concentrate our attention on, and he gives us different hints to enable us to do it, is to concentrate our attention upon Jesus and not to be diverted simply to think about these men who gathered round Jesus on this occasion. Because the vital thing for us to grasp is what is happening to Jesus and what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is saying. Because we are at the heart of the gospel. This is not meant to be a kind of psychological analysis of men's feelings, of men's emotions, of the way men respond to times of crisis. This is meant to be a gospel good news about Jesus. And I want you to notice how it is that Mark presents Jesus very briefly in three different ways that show us that this is good news about Jesus. The first thing he tells us about Jesus is that he is presented before these men as the King of the Jews. You may have noticed as we have read through Mark's Gospel together over these Sundays that one of the questions that keeps on recurring in Mark's Gospel is the question, who is Jesus? When he works a miracle, the disciples ask, who is he that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he comes to Nazareth, the people say, where did he get these powers, this mighty deed that he performs? Is this really the carpenter? And he himself says to his disciples, who are men saying that I am? It was the talk of the whole province. Who is Jesus? People were stopping one another in the street and saying, who do you think Jesus is? And Jesus was asking his own disciples, who do you say that I am? And you see in this chapter, Mark gathers together for us. Statement upon statement upon statement to answer the question. This, he says, is set before men as the king of the Jews. In verse 2, Pilate asks him, and he says, it is as Pilate says. In verse 9, do you want to re me to release to you the king of the Jews? Again in verse 12, what shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? 
And later again in verse 18 and 26 and 32, Mark sets Jesus before us as the King of the Jews, as the Messiah who had been so long promised. And yet what Mark wants to show us is that when the King is set before that which was purest of all world religion, and that which was most just, of all world empires, the Jewish religion on the one hand and the Roman government on the other hand, he is neither recognized nor accepted as the king that God has sent into the world to be their saviour and deliverer. And it is an awful thing really that these high priests and others who gathered together to accuse Jesus, who had long longed for deliverance from the yoke of Rome were now handing over him whose yoke was easy and whose burden would be light as their king to Rome itself in order that he might be crucified and that this Roman governor in Palestine to bring to bear upon Palestine the great Roman peace the Pax Romana of the ancient world was to send to his execution the one whom God had sent to be the Prince of Peace. And there is something very clear happening here. And the early church grasped it. When they began to preach and to pray, they reflected upon what had happened in the case of Jesus. And they went back to their scriptures to try to understand what was happening. And they came upon the second psalm. And the picture that psalm gives of the nations of the world joining together in order to break from their backs the yoke of the king that God had sent to rule over them. And they begin to speak to God and they begin to quote this scripture in time of trouble about how the nations of the earth were gathered together in the days of Herod and Pontius Pilate against the Lord and his anointed. And what they saw in this event was this. They saw that in the moment when the grace and saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ is most clearly seen when he is humbled before men to become their saviour. That is the very moment when man's sin is most starkly revealed for what it really is. And when men are brought face to face with the greatest issue of their lives, then the apostles and the early church began to see that on such occasions their hearts are so set against God that they will reject him. And so there was never really an occasion from the time of the Garden of Eden when sin was so clearly seen in its true colors as it is here. Sin means to be against God's king. And as representatives of both Jew and Gentile, the world surrounded Christ, exposed in its sinfulness, and revealed itself to be a world that was set against God. When he came as king to rule in gracious humility, they shouted, crucify him, and led him away. And yet in a remarkable way, I'm sure you will agree that there was no moment in his life when Jesus more seemed to be a king in total control of the situation than at this moment here. So he is set before us as a king he is set before us, Mark also indicates to us, as the servant of the Lord. It's an interesting thing that, again, on these events of the Passion, Simon Peter often reflected. And he speaks about these hours of Jesus' life, and he says this about them. In those hours, Jesus entrusted himself 
to him who judges justly. And what he means by that in the surrounding context of that passage in 1 Peter 2.23 is this. He is speaking about Jesus when he is being judged by Pontius Pilate and others, committing himself to the judgment of a higher court, a higher authority, to God's authority. Because what he is is not the prisoner of Pontius Pilate, but the servant of the Lord. And do notice in these verses how wonderfully Mark brings this out. The servant of the Lord was a picture that Jesus had used himself to describe his ministry. It was a picture that he had drawn out of the pages of the Old Testament from Isaiah 52 and 53, where we have that moving description of the suffering servant of the Lord. And Mark wants to indicate to us in what he says here, in the way he describes Jesus, this one before Pontius Pilate is that one who is described in Isaiah 53. And you notice how this comes out. For example, in verse 5, Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed, fulfilling the promise of Isaiah 53, that although he would be oppressed and afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. And although he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before her shearers, he would be dumb, and so he did not open his mouth. And here he was literally being sheared. And he opens not his mouth. Again, we find the same thing in verse 15, for example, when we are told that Pilate released Barabbas, but had Jesus flogged and delivered him up or handed him over to be crucified. And that expression is taken directly out of the Greek translation of the Old Testament that Peter and Mark and others sometimes use. From Isaiah chapter 53, that he would be delivered up for our sins and because of our iniquities. And even Pilate's question in verse 14 echoes the teaching of Isaiah 53. Why? What crime has he committed? It says the prophet Isaiah, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So that Mark is giving us these hints, these pointers. And he's saying, look, this one is the servant of the Lord about whom Isaiah prophesied. And of course he especially wants to bring out the two main points that Isaiah teaches us about the servant. The first, that he would be prepared as a sacrificial lamb in order to bring spiritual redemption to his people. And again, it's a remarkable thing, but at this very hour of the day, the priests were in the temple examining the lambs that were being brought for the slaughterhouse to be sacrificed to God. And there was one qualification they looked for, and that was that there was nothing in the lamb itself that was a qualification for it to be slain. There was nothing wrong with the lamb. It was only lambs that were unblemished and unspotted that were fit to be offered to God for the sins of others in the temple of Jerusalem. And these very men who were so accustomed to examining the lambs and recognizing that it was only unspotted ones who were fit for the sacrifice did not seem to see that the very heart of the gospel was being acted out before them and they were actors in the whole drama and they couldn't see what was happening. They couldn't see the gospel themselves that this one who was utterly unspotted was the very one that they were saying was fit for the sacrifice. Because the servant of the Lord was to be a sacrificial lamb but the servant of the Lord was also to be a substitute for sinners. He was to be wounded for others' transgressions and bruised for others' iniquities. 
And do you see how the gospel writers so skillfully weave into their story something that otherwise would be of very little significance because they want to show not only the Jewish priests could have seen the gospel in what was happening to Jesus, but even Pontius Pilate could have seen the gospel in what was happening to Jesus. Because we are told that as the crowd cried out that they should release Barabbas, Pilate released Barabbas, verse 11, instead. Instead of Jesus. Don't you see, Mark is saying to readers of the gospel, that Barabbas was released instead of Jesus and Jesus was to die instead of Barabbas. And that, he says, is the gospel. That's the good news. Even a Gentile pagan like Pontius Pilate should have been able to see it. But he wasn't dying for his own sins or his own crimes. He didn't deserve to die. But he was dying as a lamb prepared for the sacrificial knife and as a substitute in the place of sinners because he was the suffering servant of the Lord. And that leads Mark to the third thing. He is not only the king of the Jews and the servant of the Lord, but as these different groups of people stand around Jesus and reach their verdicts on him, Mark presents Jesus as the judge of all men. You see, they are reaching their verdicts for different reasons. The priests out of envy, the crowd out of manipulation, Pilate out of self-interest. And they are reaching their verdicts in very different ways. The priests, after long months of hardening their hearts, and Pilate, after the long tussle of those terrible hours, and the crowd in a moment of time, But by different ways and for different reasons, they are all reaching the same verdict, the same decision. And what they do not seem to see is that while they think they are reaching a verdict on Jesus, what they are doing is really pronouncing their own verdict. And while they think they are rejecting him, they are simply proving themselves to be rejects. And while they thought that they were preparing his destiny, they were simply writing their own destiny. Because in their very act of judging him, they were being judged by God through him. And the verdict they were to reach upon him was really to be the verdict that would be reached upon them. And so one by one they cast their verdicts. Crucify. Crucify. And however reluctantly Pilate reached it, crucify. And in judging him, They condemned themselves before Almighty God. And Mark tells us about this because this is the perennial issue. And it has never been more eloquently expressed than it was by Pontius Pilate. What shall I do with the king? What shall I do with the king? Well, my dear friends, we can scarcely read this moving passage without recognizing there are only two things we can do. We can either sing none other lamb, none other name, none other hope in heaven or earth or sea, none other hiding place from guilt and shame, none beside thee. Or our hearts can shout, however quietly crucify him crucify him and I want to say to you today that the verdict is yours 
And the verdict is yours. Yes, yours. And that is why Mark faces us with the greatest decision of our lives. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do? Oh, trust him. What else is there to do but to trust him? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are unfit even to read these words of Holy Scripture. and to see the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are grateful to you that we can read them and hear them, that we can learn about what he has done for us, that our hearts can be moved by his grace. And all we ask that you will help us to trust him, and to trust him now for his sake. Now let us close by singing from hymn number 254.